which I've done before. Okay, back to the start again. So tonight we welcome Fanula Finlay. Uh, Fanula completed her PhD in uh, Irish rock art. After this, she lived in Vancouver for over 40 years. And she moved back to Ireland relatively recently, I think in the last 10 years, and settled in West Cork, which allowed her to uh, revisit, I think, her PhD in Irish rock art. Uh, and she did so with her husband, Robert, who she met through a shared interest in Irish rock art, which is fantastic. Fanula and Robert have a fantastic blog and a Facebook page called The Roaring Water Journal. And it's up there on, on the page for any of you who are not followers. It's well worth to follow. It's up there on her blog. And it's all, she also has a really, really good uh, Facebook page as well. Uh, so Fanula has a wide uh, scope in terms of her history interests. Uh, so she's got Irish rock art, she's got tower houses, and she's also got a uh, fantastic contribution as well in terms of the stained glass history uh, here in Ireland, uh, to name a few. I'm sure there are a few more. Uh, tonight, she's joining us from West Cork and she's going to talk to us about Irish tower houses. Um, but maybe in the future, she might be back for a few more topics. So. Fanula, over to you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Liam. I uh, really appreciate it. And um, I'll, uh, I'll just switch my view here and then get started. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, Irish tower houses. Now, all of the examples, or pretty well all of the examples that I'll be using are from West Cork. Um, but that's, that's because those are the photographs I have. But um, I'm using West Cork as an exemplar. So everything I say, really, um, everything I show you can be found um, in other parts of the country as well. So um, as you look at these examples, you'll um, go out then and look at your local tower houses um, uh, or on a, your next visit to Ireland, um, you'll recognize all of the traits that I'm going to be showing you. Now, by the end of this talk, what I, what I hope um, you're going to get out of this is uh, you're going to know who built these tower houses and more importantly, why, how they could afford to do this, um, how the tower houses were actually built and once built, how did they function? Um, and why didn't they last? Uh, there are lots of medieval castles all over Europe that are still occupied. How come ours fell into such disrepair? And finally, I'm going to talk about what happens next for our tower houses. What's the future for them? So, um, first of all, let's uh, think about what came before tower houses. So, Tower houses were high status residences and they were statement residences um, and the wealthy, wealthy and the elite of society still have uh, high status and statement residences and it was no different then. So beforehand, uh, mainly if you wanted, if you were a local clan chief, you, you constructed a ring fort and you put it in a prominent place and you made sure that everybody could see it. Uh, some of them were quite simple, um, uh, some of them were quite complex, and uh, the evidence is that they were surrounded by palisades, they had dwellings inside them, the palisades may have been to keep out, uh, keep animals in, keep um, raiders out, uh, keep wolves out, um, etc. But this is what a ring fort would have looked like. Um, and then some of them, of course, were constructed of stone. This is um, Knock Drumstone Fort, uh, just outside Castle Townsend, um, with um, stone and um, thatch dwellings inside, and um, very often souterrains. Um, and this is what your average chieftain would have been li living in before the advent of the Anglo-Normans. So the Anglo-Normans, as we know, arrived in um, Ireland in 1169. It took them about 50 years to get to West Cork, um, but they did arrive and started to build castles. The first one about 1250. Um, now, what did those castles look like? Well, in West Cork, we actually don't really know. Uh, because none of them have survived. This is Liscarroll Castle in North Cork, 
it's what's called a keepless castle. So there was no keep or central tower. The residences were in the uh, corner towers or in the gate lodge. Um, it was very elaborate. It uh, had under defense as well and a moat, looked something like that. Um, but there, there is one that has survived. Now this uh, is Baltimore Castle. So for anyone who's been to Baltimore, you'll recognize this. It's been restored, wonderfully restored by the McCarthy family. Um, and it, is, it was rebuilt um, on the ashes of the original, um, the original uh, building, which in fact was not a tower house, but um, a, a hall house, uh, very different uh, in, um, in its setup to um, very different in its setup to um, a tower house. Um, this is what it would have looked like. Uh, the McCarthy's have done a really nice job of restoring it. And, um, uh, but it is not a tower house. But it's the only thing we have left that may, have, may give us a clue as to what the original Anglo-Norman houses uh, look like this Carroll Castle, the Keepless Castle, and there's another one at Glanworth that has um, a surrounding wall and a hall house in the middle. So in, in about um, 1261, um, was that, oh I got that right, 1261, uh, uh, yes 1261, under the leadership of um, Finneen McCarthy, the uh, Irish united for once um, and managed to defeat the Anglo-Normans in uh, the Battle of Callan in 1261. Now, after that, um, and this is uh, the site of the Battle of Callan, it's known locally as Macora's grave or McCarthy's grave in Kerry. Um, and after that, the um, combined forces of the Gaelic families basically rampaged through West Cork, destroying every castle in their path. And the, they burnt down the Baltimore one, but the O'Driscoll subsequently um, rebuilt it in its own footprint. So that's how we know what that looked like. Um, now, that means that the castles that we see in West Cork were not built by the Anglo-Normans. They were built by the great Irish families of the area. Um, and those families, were. Well, first of all, I'll just say that Ireland um, is probably the most castellated uh, country in Europe. Um, this is the map of tower houses in Ireland, and there are about 3,000. Uh, people talk about 7,000 uh, when you count all kinds of things that could be labeled castles. But in terms of tower houses themselves, there's about 3,000 in the whole country. Um, so in the, um, uh, in the um, area that we're going to talk about in West Cork, the great uh, families were the McCarthys, the O'Donovans, the O'Sullivans, the O'Driscolls, and the O'Mahonys. And they were the ones who set about their, a great period of castle building in the late 1400s. Now, how, how was Gaelic society organized? Well, land was owned cooperatively by an agnatic descent group, um, usually called the Durbfina. By agnatic, I mean that they traced their ancestry through a common male ancestor, a great, great grandfather. In fact, five generations um, of male ancestors. And any one of the descendants of that common great, 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 great grandfather could claim the chieftainship. Um, so, the clan was a, a kind of a corporate entity with political and legal functions, and uh, those particularly related to land. Um, but it also had responsibility for the conduct of its members, and in each lordship, election to the chieftaincy lay solely with the Derbfinna of the ruling clan. So the chieftain or Tishok was elected, and at the same time, the Tanishtha or next in, next in line was elected too. Now, this it wasn't a family in the modern sense, um, and you can see that with 
all of this going on with any one of the fifth generation being able to lay claim to the chieftaincy, it just sort of hired, hardwired into the whole society the notion that conflict would be required in order for any one particular family to gain the ascendancy and, get, and claim the chieftainship. So internal dissension was absolutely rife. And when you look at all these castles and their defensive function, remember who they were defending against was each other for the most part. Um, now the lack of stigma uh, attached to legitimacy, for example, and the ease of remarriage uh, meant that the Durbfina was continually expanding. And um, th so therefore there was great pressure. There was great pressure on land and there was great pressure on um, resources. Uh, so there was lots of raids and um, lots of um, acquiring of land from others. <clears throat> so the, um, the chieftains themselves, the ruling family, usually built several castles. So the Thishak would live in one, the Tanish in another, and then various other cousins and relatives would also be accommodated with castles. And the Omahani castles, for example, would all unite. The, the Omahani family would unite in times of threat to, to them. So around West Cork, all of these castles were built. Um, the, First thing that strikes you about all of the castles that were built around West Cork, beginning in the mid 14, mid to late 1400s, is that they're mostly by the sea. And there was a reason for that. But just take a look at the distribution. Generally, the earlier ones are on the coast. The ones that are inland, more inland, are usually a bit later, built in the 1500s. So why is that? Well, it's all about, it's all about the fish. It's all about, isn't that what the, um, isn't that what the men in, um, in the English market said to the queen? It's all about the fish. So it's all about the fish. In, um, this was the source of their wealth. Remember I said I was going to talk about how they could afford to build houses. Well, between 1330 and 1600, there was a climatic, climactic change, climatic change which caused ocean temperatures to warm in the North Atlantic. And migrating herring appeared in huge numbers off the southwest coast of Ireland. And salting became a boom industry. Now, salt fish, salt herring, was in fact one of the staples, uh, staple parts of the diet of medieval Europe. And a lot of that had to do with the number of fast days in the week and in the year and uh, not being able to eat meat, but also because it was a preserved food and in the winter it was available. So it was, there was a huge, huge trade in salted fish um, in the medieval period. Um, and the, once caught, the fish had to be uh, processed within 48 hours or they spoiled. So they were processed in what was called fish palaces um, in, um, this is just the remains of one of the fish palaces, uh, what's left to be seen uh, near Crookhaven, uh, processed, packed in barrels. Now, this was the source of the wealth for the O'Mahonies, the O'Driscolls, um, and, and the other West Cork families. They controlled the fisheries. And as soon as a, a fishing boat, and there were fleets of fishing boats that came from Spain, from Portugal, from France, from England, from um, Iceland, uh, they came to the waters of West Cork in search of these um, herring and pilchards. And um, the Omanis, for example, as soon as they saw from, their, from the battlements of their castles, as soon as they saw um, a fishing boat come anywhere close, they would be out saying, of course you can fish in our waters for a fee. Of course, of course we will reprovision you with water and food for a fee. Of course we will process your fish for you for a fee. And of course you can relax in our taverns for a fee. And those fees were exorbitant. Um, and the, um, the great families of West Cork got, in fact, extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, if you were to use um, current figures, 
they were all billionaires. And uh, because of that, um, they um, were able to uh, afford to live their lives however they wanted. Now, the, um, I, I've said already that the, these castles were defensive structures, but for the purpose of um, the West Cork, what was most important and most strategic was their sighting. And so you can see that this castle, the little bit of it that's left, had the most amazing view uh, down Dunmanus Bay, this is um, Dunbeacon Castle, all the way out to the end of both the Sheep's Head and the Mizzen Peninsula. Um, and this was incredibly important that they could see uh, as much of the sea as possible to see when the fleets were coming in. But they also needed to keep an eye on each other. And that's why in that map you see the string of castles along the coast so they were within sight of what they were looking for out at sea, but they were also keeping an eye on each other and within sight <clears throat> of each other as well. And um, the, um, the real value then of, um, of their sighting uh, was uh, whether what they could see from there, but also, of course, defensive as well. Um, where in the inland, where, where in, in parts of Ireland, um, the, the value lay in crops or cattle, uh, you'll find something similar, that castles will be situated on, in strategic areas where they have excellent views of the surrounding countryside and also of each other as well. Now, they were of course uh, also built for defense um, and many of them were not just cited uh, strategically for their view out to sea and their domination of the surrounding countryside so that everybody could see them and they could see everybody. But also many of them were built on headlands and promontories. This one, for example, at Castle Point or Lane Con, um, was built, you had to take a causeway across to it and the causeway could be destroyed um, if the castle was um, <clears throat> attacked. Here's another one. This one is called Dunanor on Cape Clear Island. And you can see that where there was a causeway at one point or some kind of land bridge, it has simply collapsed. And this castle is now pr pretty well inaccessible unless you're some kind of um, mountaineering type. And note the name to Dunanor. Uh, the O'Driscolls were really famous for their uh, ostentatious displays of wealth. This one was called Fort of Gold and Dunashade, their headquarters in Baltimore, Fort of Jewels. Um, the one in Ross Bryn, however, was famous for its learning rather than its conspicuous consumption. Now, the earliest of these castles are a type, this is Dunmanus Castle, they're a type known as raised entry. Um, so in the 1400s, this is what um, your wealthy chieftain was building. Uh, this is an O'Mahony castle, um, and the raised entry means there are two entryways, and I'll explain exactly what that means as we go along. The bottom entry, the bottom door, only gives access to a certain number of floors. The entry above it um, is to the living floor, and there's no access to the living floor from the lower floors. So that's why um, it's called raised entry. Here's another example. This is the one at Lincoln. Uh, so the actual access to the living area where the chieftain and his family uh, would have lived is the upper door, not the lower door. Um, however, in the 1500s, um, the style changed somewhat and we got what's called ground entry. So the main entry to this castle, which is Carriganas, is um, on the ground floor. And that necessitated different kinds of defenses. And I'll show you those defenses as we go along. But on the whole, this is what, this is Kana Castle in Mid Cork. Um, and this is basically what um, a tower house looked like in the 15th and 16th century in Ireland. It was taller than it was broad. It had a distinct base batter. In other words, the base of the castle splayed outwards. And that was to give it stability and also to make sure that uh, anything that was shot at it would bounce off or thrown from the roof would bounce outwards. Um, and the opes, openings, windows, usually call them opes, are very small on the lower floors and the only sizable ones are on the upper floors and even those aren't very big. The earlier castles, the 1400 ones, the 
raised entry had no fireplaces. Um, fire was often built in the middle of the floor and the, uh, and the smoke was allowed to escape out whatever way it could. Uh, they were extremely uncomfortable. They were cold, they were damp, but uh, places of legendary hospitality at the same time. The slightly later ones, the ground entry, usually had fireplaces and were significantly more comfortable. So let's take a look now at the castles, uh, starting with the exterior. And um, I have to say that the illustrations that I'm using here are by the artist J.G. O'Donoghue, and he has allowed me, he's given me permission to use these illustrations when I talk about tower houses. But he's done an absolutely brilliant job, as you'll see as we go along. So this, uh, illustri this tower house, and he's illustrated it both externally and internally, which you'll see, this tower house is based on the one at Kilcray, uh, outside Cork, um, when it's near um, ovens. Um, and what you can see is that the tower house itself is surrounded by a bawn, um, and around the bawn, or internal sort of courtyard, is a bawn wall. And in this case, the bawn wall has three towers. Um, it, the tower is um, taller than it's wide, it's a ground entry one. All of the opes are small, uh, in other words, to prevent any kind of access into the castle through a window. Um, the opes are either windows or they're arrow loops. The uh, top of the castle features a battlement, and I'll go through those features of the uh, battlements as we go along. And um, the... Um, uh, you can see that it's, there's a village in the distance and there's a contemporary account uh, that talks about um, every two miles there was a castle with its village. Um, and then let's just to take another look, I want to point out two things. And one is that in the distance, just to the right, top right of the castle, you can see another castle. And um, just illustrating that castles were visible from each other. And then the other thing, of course, that uh, two more things I want to point out. One is the little Sheelanagig on the wall of the castle, about uh, two thirds of the way up the wall, you'll see a little uh, carving. And I'll show you an example of that as we go along. And then the other thing is the color of the castle. Um, and these castles were not stone colored. Um, they were rendered on the outside. Um, and the rendering was made of a whole variety of things, chiefly lime, of course. The rendering, of course, was to keep the weather out. Uh, without it, um, it, it would have been, they would have been extremely wet. Um, and each lime um, maker had his own formula and put in all kinds of things, including a lot of organic material, ground bone and ox blood and feathers and shell and you name it. And, with the result that each of these castles uh, came out a different color. Now, most of them, I think, maybe were white, but when you look at Irish place names, you'll see references to White Castle. In fact, we have two around here. We've White Castle and White Hall. Black Castle, which is another name for the Lamecon one. Um, you'll see uh, Yellow Castle, Green Castle, Red Castle, Cashlon, Derg, for example, Castle Derg, anything like that is, is Red Castle. There's a Cashlon, Cashel Dwi in, I think, Tipperary. Uh, so um, these castles were, they were statement residences. They were made to stand out in the landscape. They were made to be seen from a long way away. They were made to instill respect, even fear. And um, part of that, was uh, the external appearance of them. Now, there is also a certain, uh, you know, they, they all look like this, tower houses all look like this. And, and what sort of created the look, the look of tower houses? Well, believe it or not, it was the first example of a European grant system. So in, and you know, the Irish love a grant, and so there was a proclamation uh, issued by Henry IV in 1429, and I'm going to just read you out the proclamation. It, it said, it is agreed and asserted that every liege man of our Lord, the king of the said counties, and the said counties referred to the pale around Dublin, 
who chooses to build a castle or tower house sufficiently embattled or fortified, whither the next 10 years, to wit, 20 feet in length, 16 feet in width, and 40 feet in height, height or more, uh, that the commons of the said county shall pay the said person to build a said castle or tower 10 pounds by way of subsidy. And so this gives us another name for the castles, which is the 10 pound castles. So let's take a look now, starting with the interior, uh, with the exterior, sorry. Um, each of these castles was built by a master mason and um, a band of stone workers. And um, I just put this one up to show you a couple of things. First of all, uh, it was done using scaffolding and the scaffolding was attached to the castle. And as you look at castles, you very often see holes in the walls. Those are called put log holes because that's where the logs were put for, to hold the scaffolding. And I'll show you a couple of examples of those as we go along. The chamfered or, or um, worked stone was kept for the visible parts and the interior of the walls were filled with rubble. And there's, um, there's there was probably a band of stonemasons who went around the country, kind of like the, um, the, the combine harvesters and bailers do nowadays, going from place to place and building castles. And so they had their, their plans and uh, they knew what um, they, the original 10 pound castle dimensions tended to be the kind of the cookie cutter that, um, <clears throat> that determined what these castles then started to look like. So the first thing that you notice about the castles in West Cork is that they're, they're always built on rock. And of course, this creates a very solid foundation, but it also is a weakness in the sense that once it goes, it's gone forever. Once a castle like this starts to slide off its base, and many of them have done so, um, they, uh, they, there's no holding them. So it's a strong foundation, but also uh, in many ways, a very weak one as well. The other thing you'll notice is the base batter. I've already alluded to that. This is Rinkaliski Castle, and it's a good example of how the base splays out. And this gives it, uh, in fact, a lot. Um, these are huge edifices and big, big, thick walls. Uh, so there's a lot of weight bearing down. And so this extra thick base um, uh, is, is very functional. However, it also, there's a, there's a vulnerability to that, and I'll show you that um, as we go along. <clears throat> the, uh, there are various, um, this is Carrig, um, Balmacarriga Castle, and uh, I just want you to notice uh, very quickly that this is a base, uh, a ground level castle, and it has um, a, what's called a bartizan, a corner matriculation, a projecting part, uh, which guarded the front door. There was another way in which this front, was front door was guarded, and that was by a sentry box right inside it. And you see the little square hole on the left-hand side of the door. That is a peephole from the sentry box um, at uh, Balnacarriga. Now, do you remember I mentioned the um, Shilnagig? Balnacarriga Castle, has one. And um, this is it. Um, so there's lots and lots of theories as to exactly what uh, would the function of Sheila and the gigs were. Um, but one of them, because you do find them on castles like this, one of them is that it was to attract the evil eye. And therefore, by doing that, by being the thing that attracted the evil eye, to keep the evil eye away from the people inside the castle, to repel it, as it were. Now, um, this is uh, Abbey Mahon Castle um, on the way to Court and Cherry. And really, all that's left uh, of it is this corner. And the reason I show you this is to show you the, the, really the only worked stone in this whole castle. Most of it is very rough, uh, rough quarried stone, and, but the, the worked one is the corners, the point, Q-U-O-I and the coin stones on the corners. And of course, this made them, this, the fact that they were kind of worked stones made them quite attractive. And so uh, in uh, Carrigan-Ass Castle, they've all been, they've all disappeared, all the coins have disappeared. But it does, um, it does show us how they were fitted. So it's, it's kind of nice to have that too at the same time, even though it's a pity. 
Now, remember I also said that the master builder had his band of stone, uh, stone masons and uh, the, the quality of the building uh, varied enormously. This is Lincoln Castle and the very base level is modern. That was repaired and I'll show you uh, later on uh, uh, how exactly that was repaired. But above that, it almost is like um, apprentice work. Um, there's big stones, little stones, flat stones, square stones. And at one point it looks like they rollicked in from the pub and weren't too sure what level they were going to do. And then at the top, it kind of evens out again. So it's always interesting to look at um, a castle and to see what kind of quality. Now, this would have been hidden, of course, under the uh, external render, but still we can see the evidence of the uh, master builder and uh, what, um, how, how closely he was keeping an eye on his workers. This one is much better. This is the um, three castle head right at the end of the Nissan Peninsula. And you can see the quality of the workmanship, the very, very flat, even stones. And on the left-hand side at the uh, curtain wall, you can also see the rubble fill in the middle. So the, the work stone was kept to the outside and then the interior filled with rubble. Here's one, this little place, uh, no, this is Arden Tenon Castle, and you can see that the base batter, which has lots of nice stones in it, has been robbed. And when, I'm, when I use the term robbed, that's actually a technical term, meaning that it's missing. I'm not accusing my neighbors of doing anything. So the, um, however, because of that, you can see that this would create a lot of instability in a castle, that the local, stone, the local farmers have taken the stone to use uh, for their own purposes. Now, the bond wall on the outside, this is at Carriganas, the bond wall on the outside uh, was part of the defensive structure, of course. It had a wall walk on the top of it and then <clears throat> opes um, along it. And uh, there are two opes that you can see in this wall. The one on the right hardly looks like it could be used for anything. Um, and the one on the left. So on the outside, what you saw was a very small opening. And uh, of course, um, it had to be small so that nobody could get in through it. But on the inside, the opes were deeply splayed. And that was so that an archer could get his head and shoulders and his bow and arrow into the, uh, into the hole from the inside. Here's a much more sophisticated arrow loop. This one is from uh, Kilcray, cruciform shape. And you can see that a cruciform shape like this would have given a much greater uh, range uh, of, um, of aim. Uh, and also, I'll just go back to the previous one. Oh, uh, do you see the kind of the way it's being rounded at the bottom of the, of the cross? Uh, sometimes these loops were modified to become musket loops rather than arrow loops. And uh, so the musket, the long barrel of the musket would rest in that hole. Um, now, a uh, quick, just a quick recap, recap here. This is a castle some of you may know. This is Ross Castle in Killarney. And just to go through, uh, take a look. It's built on rock. It's, um, it's got um, all the small opes, the small holes, uh, openings at the bottom, bigger windows at the top. It's got uh, the battlements. It's got a corner machicolation, machicolation being the projecting piece uh, from the battlements. And so therefore we can call that a bartizan. And it's got um, what's called Irish crenellations. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those um, in a bit. The crenellations, uh, very typical of the Irish way of building. Um, here's, uh, this is Kilcray again. This is the wall walk. You can go right up to the top of this castle at Kilcray. And if you have the nerves, you can go across the wall walk into the little sentry uh, sentry hut. Uh, I obviously did not have the nerves. Uh, but the, um, the flagstones that you see laid out are drainage flags. Um, and so they carry the water away. The roof would have come down partly over these and they carry the water away and uh, away from the castle. Um, you see the little sentry um, uh, hut there as well. And if you take a look at the window, on the left, you can, um, this window uh, has been modified, has been, has had a chimney added to it, uh, which is kind of 
uh, off on the left of the of the window. Uh, this is another good example of a wall walk or uh, along the battlements. And this is Docky Castle. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with this castle. Um, the lady of the castle is giving Robert a tour um, and he's up in the behind the crenellations. Uh, it, it's well worth a visit, by the way, this castle, very well done. Now, um, I talked about the machicolations, the pro, uh, projecting uh, part, and um, uh, this is uh, Castle Donovan. So I want you to look at the two corner bartizans, but I also want you to look at the fact that there are these holes, uh, a, a series of holes along the top of the wall. Now, partly that uh, could have been from these um, slabs that were carrying water off the wall work, but the, there's another, uh, function for these holes, and that was to uh, support uh, hoarding that would have uh, extended the matriculations. And I couldn't find any, the only really good illustration of that concept was from a French castle. So try to, uh, try to ignore the fact that this is obviously from Carcassonne or someplace like that, and just look at the hoarding. So this is how the matriculation would have uh, been extended by wooden hoardings rather than all stone matriculations. Um, the bomb uh, built around, of course, as I said, was part of the defense. Sometimes it was extended um, along a natural defensive feature uh, to create a curtain wall. And this uh, is in Carrigan-Ass, and you can see how, how pretty well impregnable um, a river like this and a situation like this right beside your river uh, would have made it. In some cases, um, and this is three castle head in uh, at the end of the Mizzen Peninsula, absolutely fabulous place if you ever get a chance to visit. There's a long, long, long wall. There's no bond. There's a long curtain wall punctuated by three towers. Um, and uh, because this near end, uh, there's a huge cliff going down to the sea and the far end is a lake, there was no, that was the best defensive mechanism, was simply to build a wall and punctuate it with towers. So let's go now and take a look at the interior of the castles. And you'll see that uh, JG, not content with um, showing you the outside, has done this marvelous, absolutely marvelous cutout of the interior of the castles. Um, and what I want to point out to you uh, mainly uh, in this illustration, because I'm going to go through the floors in, in order then, um, is that uh, this is what we call a double vaulted castle. So let's go through the floors from the bottom. So the ground floor, the floor of the ground floor would have been rammed earth or maybe stone, um, and it's used for storage. The uh, second floor, um, the floor is wood, and he has depicted it here as a kind of uh, sleeping place for the uh, soldiers. Now, the next floor up, which he shows as a scene of domesticity, although what we feel is that most of the cooking would actually have taken place in, outside the castle, um, but this floor is made of stone. And the reason for that is that there is a vault um, over the first and second floor. So the only way up to the second floor is through the staircase in the wall. Um, going up from the, the main entry. Um, so the, the, that's the first vault. Then um, at, above that is the um, bedchamber, and that's the second vault. So there's two stone vaults, and the other floors are made of wood. And then at the very top is uh, the solar uh, with the bigger windows. Uh, that would be the area where the chief and his family lived. And particularly, it was the woman's domain as well and the place for entertaining guests. Now, um, the, um, so that you can see that there's a straight fire, uh, uh, staircase going up from the main entry. And the, um, above that, it turns into a spiral staircase, which is built into the wall, in this case, at the corner of the wall. Sometimes there's a tower um, added on to um, accommodate the staircase. So let's take a look at the floors um, sort of in, in pieces then. So here we are um, on the first, the ground floor and the first floor. Now, remember I said that 
there were the, the, the most important thing when you're defending a, a castle is not to let people in. So how do you keep attackers out? Well, in this case, the main entry had a portcullis, which could be lowered. Once you were inside that, if you managed to get through that, you were in a small chamber. There was a wall, there was a door to the left of you and a door straight ahead of you. And if both of those were closed, you were basically trapped inside the small room. And above you was a hole, which is generally known as a murder hole, with um, allowing um, a defender to rain down upon you uh, stones, uh, arrows, boiling oil, whatever they wanted. And sometimes this murder hole is on the first floor, sometimes it's actually two floors up. But you can see that um, uh, this uh, is a very good defensive, defensive mechanism. The, um, this, as I said, is based on Kilcray. And now I'm going to show you exactly what Kilcray looks like. So remember, you've got the main entry, the small chamber, a door to the left, a door straight ahead, and the murder hole above you. So here it is. This is the main entry to Kilcray Castle. You can see that there was a door to the left, a door straight ahead, and the murder hole above you. So you can see this is exactly how uh, JG has based his drawing. Um, and I think I mentioned too with ground entries, they didn't all have this feature. Some of them had a sentry box or sentry room inside. Looking out through this peephole, you were told to present your face and your business to the peephole. And if they didn't like what they saw, I guess you were in trouble. Now, the raised entry um, tower houses, that was, um, they had to be defended somewhat differently. So the bottom uh, floor entrance, the entrance to the ground floor, led only into um, the floors under the first vault. And you could not get um, into the upper floors from uh, from going through the ground floor, ground floor entry. You could only get into the upper floors by going through the raised entry. And um, from the raised entry, there was a straight staircase that went up and around the corner and up into the fourth and fifth floors. But I also want you to see the arrow pointing to the dungeon as well, um, because that was accessed only from uh, a certain area as well. So let's go inside the uh, ground floor entry and see what we see now inside. So here's what we see. We go in, there is an enormous vault, um, corbelled vault, and you can see immediately uh, the projecting corbels for two other floors. You see the uh, projecting corbels on the right-hand side upon which um, beams would have rested to create a second floor and then a very um, claustrophobic third floor further up. And you see the door on the upper left of the screen. That was the way you got into the um, dungeon. Uh, there was only, um, was the only way you could get into the dungeon um, and you couldn't get access from the dungeon or from the entrance to the dungeon um, into the upper floors. A very, very clever design, very restricted. Um, and what did the dungeon look like? Well, here it is. Um, you can imagine that uh, it's extremely cramped. It was absolutely pitch black. Um, the wall, part of the wall has been removed for some reason. So that allows us to see uh, what this dungeon looked like. Once you were in there and there was only one way in and one way out, and this was it, a hole in the ceiling. And once you were in there, you could be forgotten about. It was really an oubliette. Now, going back into the main uh, vaulted room, just a couple of features. If you ever go into castles um, or medieval buildings to look out for, uh, the doors, of course, um, were barred from the inside. And this is a bar hole that would have held one of the large bars, held the door closed once, once it was closed on the inside. Um, and then they were hung from an, a hanging eye, an eye on, in the top, and a spud stone in the bottom. And those uh, are still in Dunmanus Castle. 
Here's um, Raheen Castle, um, Castle Haven, um, and I love this because it's almost like somebody has taken a slice and for the benefit of archaeologists have, has made a cross section, a slice right down through. Of course, locals will tell you that this castle was bombarded by Cromwell and you can still see uh, the cannonballs in the wall, but you know, that's a common story. But what's really interesting about this is you can see the vault and you can see how the floor above the vault would have rested. Now, the, the vaults um, were for fire prevention, but also for stability in the building. And you can see how when something is tall and heavy, it can have a tendency to fall outwards. And this vault would have also given a, lo a lot of internal stability. But the vaults weren't always continuous. Sometimes they were simply arches, and the arches then were covered with great big slabs, in this case, of a, sort of a slaty, a flat slaty stone. Now, um, when you look at the arch, the closer arch to you, you can see what looks like a kind of almost like a basket weaving um, effect on it. Um, this is uh, evidence of what's called wicker centering. So the arch itself was built by means of a scaffold and the scaffold was of course arch shaped. And once the scaffold was in place, um, all kinds of mortar was packed on top of the scaffold and then the stone started to be laid on top of that mortar. Eventually, when the uh, wicker scaffold was taken down, it left an impression in the mortar. And that impression, that uh, castle was probably built in the 15th century and the uh, impression of the wicker uh, is still there. The wicker centered mortar construction is still there to this day. Oh, and by the way, before I move on from that, if you take a look at the far wall, you can see some of those holes. Remember I said it was all built by scaffolding and you can uh, still see the scaffolding holes, the putt log holes. There, here's a castle with um, no central, uh, in fact, it does have one vault, um, a, a very, very uh, cramped basement uh, vault, vault with a stone uh, floor. Um, almost like a dungeon itself. But the rest of the building, this is Castle Donovan, the rest of the building has no, um, has no uh, vault at all, um, just wooden floors, um, accessed by a spiral staircase in um, a corner tower. Um, you can see that this was a slightly later one too because it's got a fireplace and fireplaces uh, were more the 16th century rather than the 15th century. Uh, this is our own castle. Our house looks down on this one. It's called Ross Bryn. Um, and you can see the remains of some vaults there uh, as well. It's amazing what you can still see just in such a vestigial sort of edifice. Uh, this is Dunanor I, I sh on Cape Deer. I think I showed you a, um, a, fr a, a shot from the sea. Um, and you can see the, um, part the, the vault and you can see the straight mural staircase as well. This is a, a spiral staircase um, in um, Three Castle Head, uh, just with an illustration of how staircases like this were built, central newel post and then each tread laid um, uh, using that as a fulcrum. This uh, is Kilcray Castle and once again the, the just the sheer quality of construction in Kilcray is amazing because it, um, uh, you can see every stone is shaped and the, it, it creates this wonderful sort of sinuous uh, spiral staircase. Um, the internal windows were deeply splayed. Uh, even something like this is on the ground floor of, I think, Kilcray. Um, and the, even such a tiny window as this could bring in a lot of light um, once the internal um, um, sort of windowsill was, was as wide as this. Now, I know that the real question that's on all your minds has to do with plumbing, and we all want to know, uh, how did they manage this part of things at all? And you'll be delighted to hear that these medieval castles had internal plumbing. Um, here's a good example. This is from Ben Duff or ca uh, Castle or Castle Salem in West Cork. Um, and as you can see, it's a, it's a true banger. And the people who have partly restored this castle have provided a nice little niche for the moss across from the, uh, from the true banger. This uh, next one, I, I believe, is um, uh, Balnacarriga Castle, and it is looking down the uh, chute 
the shoot from the uh, from the uh, garter rope. Now the um, the uh, rooms in which these uh, toilets were situated were called garter robes. Um, there was a belief that the uh, this, the uric acid and the ammonia that was generated uh, would keep fleas away, and so robes were uh, hung in the um, in these chambers. Um, you can see in this illustration, JG has shown that um, there's in fact a straight shoot down, and there's also an offshoot, um, so that uh, there's a, another uh, toilet provided for uh, lower down. And uh, indeed, um, we see evidence of this at Dunmanus Castle. Um, can you see the um, division of the garderobe chute um, uh, all uh, going up so that there was um, two different chutes coming down? And at the bottom is the, uh, the exit, the chute exit. Um, and of course, somebody had to keep an eye on these exits. So here is Robert being the inspector of drains. And this is in Kilcrae. Uh, there were various uh, chambers in the walls, if the walls were thick enough as well. This is simply a, a mural chamber. We're not sure what function it would have, um, would have uh, been for. Uh, now let's go uh, right to the top. And um, we'll take a look at the uh, upper floors. Uh, of course, you'll see that there were bigger windows. Lots. JG does really, really good research, lots of evidence for uh, the kind of internal painting and decorating. Um, and if you've ever visited any of the restored castles, like Donegal Castle, for example, you'll see examples of the furnishing and the wall decorations and that kind of thing. Um, fireplaces, uh, more comfortable um, than the uh, raised entry castles, for sure. Um, and um, the other thing I'd like to point out at this point is the battlements. So the final piece of stairway uh, is to get you up to the battlements. And these, uh, I think I mentioned, are called Irish crenellations. So the crenels are the spaces in between the merlins. And the merlins are the taller parts, the stepped battlement. And so the idea was that you hid behind the merlin you um, got your bow all notched up, and then you quickly came into, stepped into the crenel, let loose your arrow, and hid behind the merlin again. Um, and uh, because of the stepped design, it's quite uh, unique to Ireland. These are generally known as Irish crenellations. Um, so going back then into the solar, uh, this is the actual solar at Kilcray Castle. As I said, you can walk right up. And you can see the Gothic windows. And the style of architecture was generally Gothic. That's what we'd call it um, in these castles. Um, this one's pretty overgrown. This is um, Balnacarraga Castle, um, uh, just outside uh, Dunmanway. And uh, you can see the beautiful uh, cobbled floor still intact. Absolutely amazing. And what are we all looking at? Well, this is what we're looking at. So there aren't a lot of carvings. Um, in uh, Irish castles, but this one um, has several in, in the window embrasures. Uh, this is a crucifixion scene. Um, and here's a, a sort of a conjectural reconstruction of what that might have looked like in the middle of a feast. And um, talking about feasts, here's the famous um, 1581 John Derrick um, uh, Max Sweeney's feast. So uh, the first thing I want to do is assure you that what is being boiled over the fire is not a baby. It's um, some, some kind of meat of some kind. Um, this is shown outdoors, but it would have been very similar to what was uh, indoors. So there's McSweeney and his lady on his right hand side, uh, a priest giving a blessing, another one on his left. Um, various uh, cooking things going on and carving things, the bard reciting poetry or perhaps a hymn of praise to Max Weenie himself or perhaps a story being accompanied by the harpists. And what about those two guys over on the right? What are they doing? Well, after extensive research, I have discovered that there was a class of entertainer in medieval Ireland um, called professional farters and they were quite capable of farting tunes um, in tune and uh, in harmony with each other. 
So there's an Irish feast for you in 1581. Now, the other question I said uh, I wanted to talk about was what happened to these castles? I mean, other European countries, castles are still inhabited. They're continually inhabited for hundreds and hundreds of years. How come uh, ours, most of ours, fell into either disuse or, in fact, into uh, complete disrepair or disappeared altogether? Well, first of all, we started the decline of the uh, the power of the great Irish families started during the reign of Henry VIII, 1541, the surrender and regrant system really started the process of destroying the the old Gaelic order and their way of organizing themselves. So the Derbfinna, for example, and the common possession of land and the um, succession and all of that. Um, the surrender and regrant system meant that they would surrender their uh, their land, be regranted it by the king um, on on long term leases, and receive English titles rather than um, their own Irish or it, receive English titles. So Finnean O'Driscoll, for example, became Sir Finnean O'Driscoll, um, and. Um, it wasn't just that, though. I mean, part of uh, part and parcel of the surrender and regrant system was they had to undertake no longer to speak the Irish language. They had to the succession had to be primogenitor. The oldest son had to inherit everything. Um, the, they had to own the land rather than share it in common with their people. And it was just a really seismic change. Um, and. The, the the sort of I just want to read you out. Um, uh, really, it was the Battle of Kinsale, though, that sounded the death knell for the old Irish Gaelic way of life, because this is where, of course, at the end of the Nine Years' War, they were completely defeated, and um, at the time of the Down Survey in 1657, all of the O'Mahony castles all of these wonderful string of proud castles all throughout West Cork, they were all untenanted, untenanted and described as ruinous. And that was only 50 years after the Battle of Kinsale. And by the end of the 17th century, none of them remained in Irish hands. And the, um, this castle, which is called Toker Castle, which was a very late one, um, it sort of epitomizes what happened. Um, it was built by Taig on Orsa, Taig of the Force, McCarthy. It was eventually inherited and lived in by Taig on Duna, Taig of the Fort, who led the McCarthy forces in the rebellion of 1642. And that rebellion, as many of you know, ended in complete devastation. The land was forfeit and given to the Hoare brothers. And the condition Taig on Duna was left in was described by a contemporary poet. And I'll just read you a snippet from the poem in Irish and then in English. Ni taig on duna tanam, och taig gan dun, gan dangan, taig gan bo, gan kapal, imahanin ishal datuk, taig gan ban, gan lanav. Not taig of the dun thy name, but taig without dun, without stronghold. Taig without cow, without ho house, in a low, smoky little cabin. Taig without wife, without child. And that sort of summarizes the awful decline of the great Gaelic chieftains. The next uh, era of castle building consisted of these fortified manor houses. This is uh, Coppinger's Court in West Cork. You can see that it's a completely different style of building. It's built for comfort. There's big windows, uh, lots of fireplaces. All of the um, staircases are wooden and internal, but it's still fortified. It still speaks to the contentious issues of life in West Cork. Now, what's the future? What, what happens next um, to uh, the castles that we have left? Well, let's get the bad news over first. Here uh, is the same map that I showed you in the beginning of all the castles that once were built in West Cork. Um, here's the current situation. So only 11 castles have been stabilized or reconstructed. Those are the green ones. The blue ones are all either vestigial or in danger. Uh, they're not safeguarded in any way. And the red ones have simply disappeared some of them with absolutely no trace. 
So here's one, for example. This is Arda Castle just outside Baltimore. And can you see anything? No. On top of that hill was once uh, a tower house. Absolutely nothing left. Here's Whitty Island, uh, an O'Sullivan Bear Castle. Um, all that's left is one corner. This one is at Montine, and you can see it won't last. The base batter has been robbed. The, uh, the uh, bottom floor is collapsing. Um, I don't give this one too much longer. And this is, I think, maybe one of the saddest pictures. This is the wall of the Bon at Old Court. And you can see that one stone, one more stone being dislodged here, and that wall is coming down. However, it's not all bad news. There is some good news, and mostly the good news in West Cork is where some quixotic, romantic, crazy person has taken on the job of rejuvenating one of these castles. And I have three examples to show you. So the first one is the one um, called Lincoln or Castle Point or Black Castle. It has all of those names. And this is the condition it was on in, in 1960 when Niall Hyde from Dublin came down with his family and said, oh, that looks like a nice project, I'll take that on. This was the condition of the uh, base batter. It had been completely robbed and very unstable. And so the first thing he did was to set about um, repairing that. So this is what the castle looks like now. Um, and this is Niall's car. Uh, you, he has rebuilt the causeway. Uh, which was uh, which simply didn't exist. So he rebuilt the causeway, and uh, the first thing he did was to stabilize the base battery. Remember, I showed you a picture, and I said this was all modern. So he's very um, adroitly rebuilt that, um, separating it out with so that everyone can see what where the the old and the new meet. And here's Niall and Robert enjoying a nice cup of tea in his solar and he loves it and he goes there every day and he has single-handedly salvaged this castle. Here's his little kitchen, isn't it lovely? Now here's another one called Rinkaleski um, and this has been uh, also um, redone uh, by uh, Stephanie Jacks and her family um, and as she herself said, look, Niall Hyde isn't wealthy, I'm not wealthy, but we've managed to do this. Um, so this castle um, probably would have had um, a floor more originally. Um, I'm just going to go back to the cast, the picture of the vault um, inside Dunmanus. Remember I told you there's three floors in this vault, in this internal vault, the first, second and third floor, the ground first and second floor of Dunmanus Castle. So what did that what does it look, might it have looked like? Well, here's Stephanie's reconstruction of, here's, she has turned the first floor into the main kitchen and dining area. Um, although it's out of uh, frame, you, there is a wall, a, a staircase going up on the left-hand side to the second, second floor. And here's the second and third floor under, and you can see how she's done under the vault. And by dint of using a lot of whitewash, and uh, the splayed windows and lots of light. Um, it's actually amazingly bright in there for something with very few windows. And she's left the putt log holes uh, visible as well. And here's the top. You can actually go and rent this castle and stay in it. Um, the uh, bathroom quarters are a little tight, but they are in the original garderobe. And my final example of what a crazy, quixotic, romantic man can do with lots of money is uh, this one. This is Kilco Castle. It's the absolute um, twin of uh, Dunmanus, the exact same um, design. And that's what it looked like in the 1970s. This is what it looks like now. Um, and that's Jeremy Irons. Uh, and great, great, great thing that he did. He restored it, very historically accurate, including the color. Um, and restored the bond um, and uh, has done a fantastic job of it. So there are many castles, there are a few castles in state care. Most of them are in private ownership and uh, falling apart, quite frankly. Um, there, as you can imagine, with 3,000 castles in Ireland, uh, 
the government can't possibly save all of them. But, you know, where you get private individuals with a dream, a lot can be done as well. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm now going to, um, I'm now going to stop sharing. Is that right, Liam? That's perfect. And thank you so much. That was a fascinating lecture. Um, I think it covered a lot of our history. Um, and I've got a couple of questions here for you. Um, what can be done to share aspects of our history that I've kind of, I suppose, as, as, you, as, as you've explained that over the last um, half hour, have been kind of lost. So what government initiatives can be uh, put in place to ensure that those aspects of our history can be maintained? Yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because um, heritage, of course, only gets so much of the budget. Um, it'd get a lot more if I was in charge. But um, um, unfortunately, um, you know, there's there's uh, there's only a limited amount that can be spent, and so um, really, it's up to it's up to um, individuals like the ones that I mentioned uh, who who have salvaged these amazing um, edifices. Um, there's, it's very difficult because uh, we see lots of them where, you know, maybe the farmer hasn't done any actual damage, but he isn't able to maintain a 500 year old building. Um, now there are some uh, grants, uh, adopt a monument grant, but really uh, they're not big enough for, you can imagine, I think that Jeremy Irons is supposed to have spent six million on restoring Kilco. Now, certainly uh, Stephanie and Niall didn't spend anywhere near like that, but you can see what Jeremy got for that. I mean, it is absolutely magnificent. And if you, if you want, you can Google Jeremy Irons Vanity Fair. Uh, the, the Vanity Fair ran a whole um, uh, piece on him and the castle, and it's full of pictures of the interior of the castle, if you're curious about what it looks like inside. But I know that they, um, they talk all the time about having to run up and down lots and lots of stairs all the time. I know I'm not answering your question. It's, it's a difficult one. It is, and, and I kind of came across you um, yourself through that when you came across uh, a great post on, on Kilri. Oh, Kilri, you ready? Uh, yeah. Hello. Like. Um, which is a fantastic site and it's just like 500 meters away from me here in Kells and I was just kind of taken by you know someone like yourself uh, having that interest in a location close to me here in Kells so what drives you to explore all these places? Well um, as you said in the beginning I've, um, I've I moved back here I I started off life as a historian and archaeologist, but spent most of my adult life doing anything but that. And it's been a complete joy to move back to Ireland, which I did about eight years ago, and rediscover, relearn, you know, reapply myself to learning a lot of what I knew in my early 20s. And, um, uh, and really, it's not about books. I mean, to get out into the field, to visit these places. And you know, you cannot go anywhere in Ireland without having the chat, meeting the farmer, having adventures, getting out into and seeing amazing places. And it doesn't matter where you go. I mean, West Cork is fantastic, but so is Offaly, so is Donegal, so is Clare, so is Wicklow. Um, and every single place has these little hidden gems around every corner. And so, in Canada, where history was 200 years old, um, prehistory was 10,000 years old, um, it's been absolute joy to just come back and, and relearn, reacquaint myself, re-explore my own country. And um, I think you can see the, the bookshelves at the back. Uh, it's, you know, a well-known addiction, isn't it? Buying history books and... Um, I wish I could say I'd read all of them, but uh, we certainly have built up a good library now, Robert and I, for, for our explorations. Yeah, I think you've done a, an absolutely amazing job. I, I, I love your blog, I love your Facebook page. I, th I think it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic to see people 
coming from uh, West Cork, up to us here in, in Kilkenny and engaging with our history up here and helping us explore our own local history. Uh, there's a couple of aspects that I think is important. I think, you know, uh, you've had a post on Kilry, you've had some posts on Kells Priory. It's great to see that gaining kind of national significance. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks a million for your engagement this evening. I think you've done an amazing job and hopefully we'll see you back again to talk on another topic. All Thanks. right. Thank you, everybody. Bye.